Thank you. Thank you so much. I heard my name twice and everybody laughed after it, but I didn't know anything else that was said. So it was... It was okay. Um, I'm so happy this is working. So I am so, um, I am so inspired to see so many people here today. I've been, you know, I'm from the United States. I'm now living in Germany and I've been giving my talks about carnism and veganism around the world. Um, and I've always wanted to come to Israel. It's been on the top of my list of places to come. We've been hearing in the United States and in Germany about the amazing things that are happening here. And so I'm curious to learn from you and I've been curious to see what's going on with my own eyes. And um, thank you for the amazing work you're doing. It's just such a privilege. So let's get started. So um, today I'm going to talk about the stories, um, the fictions, the fictitious stories that are created by and help create the dominant animal eating culture. And about the powerful impact of these stories, about the powerful impact of these stories on ourselves and our world. I'm gonna talk about this because recognizing these stories is essential for the empowerment of us as individuals and also for the vegan movement. And the foundation of this empowerment is called speaking truth to power. So now, to explain this concept of speaking truth to power, I'm actually going to share a story with you, briefly. As many of you probably know, through the first half of the 20th century, women were considered inferior to men, and they were there, therefore destined for a life of domestic servitude. So many women lived lives of boredom and isolation, and yet they just accepted their fate. But then in the 1960s, something happened. Women began talking with each other about their feelings and experiences. And over time, these conversations led to the establishment of um, formal discussion groups. And as more and more women shared their stories, they realized that they were having similar experiences, such as being abused by their domestic partners. And what they realized was that they were not inferior. They were oppressed. So these groups empowered women to speak out against their, we're having a little mic problem, to speak out against their oppression. They empowered women to speak truth to power. And these groups actually helped launch the modern women's liberation movement, which was to change the world. So there are important lessons in this story for us as individuals and as vegans. Of course, stories shape our lives and our world for better or worse. For example, when women believed the story of the dominant sexist culture, when they looked at themselves through the eyes of males, they believed that it was their own personal deficiencies that were to blame for their lower social status. But when they shared their own stories, they realized that the problem was actually rooted in external power structures. Stories can be fiction or fact. For example, the story that women were inferior because they were overly emotional, irrational, and weak was a fiction. It was based on gross distortions about women's true nature and experience. True stories, on the other hand, reflect the authentic truth of our experience. And widespread stories reflect and reinforce a widespread belief system or ideology. For instance, the widespread story that women were inferior didn't come out of nowhere. It reflected the widespread ideology of sexism. And the more women and men alike believed in this story, the more they acted it out and reinforced the stereotypes, for example, of dominant males and submissive females. So today, today I'm going to talk about the widespread stories that our culture teaches us about eating and not eating animals and about the ideology that drives these stories. I'm focusing on this subject because as soon as we recognize these stories for what they are, as fictions, we can rewrite them and we transform our relationship to them. So we can have more fulfilling and inspired lives as individuals and be significantly empowered and more effective as activists. Because when we change our stories, we change our lives 
and our world. Now, before we talk about the specific stories, I want to briefly talk about the ideology that breeds these stories. Now, a lot of people here are familiar with my original work on the ideology of eating meat, so I'm going to only talk about this briefly. In much of the world, people still believe that there is no ideology or belief system of the dominant animal eating culture. There's vegans and vegetarians, and then there's everybody else. But when eating animals is not necessary for survival, which is the case for many people in the world, then it is a choice. And choices always stem from beliefs. And so this is the ideology that I've called carnism, the invisible belief system or ideology that conditions us to eat certain animals. Now, carnism is a global phenomenon. It exists around the world. It is, as I've said, a dominant ideology. It's woven through the very structure of society, shaping norms, laws, beliefs, behaviors, etc. It becomes internalized to shape the very way we think and feel about eating animals. And of course, it's a violent ideology. So cardism is truly a system of oppression. But people who participate in carnism, people who eat animals, also actually care about animals. And so, of course, carnism and similar ideologies need to use the set of defense mechanisms that distort people's thoughts and numb their feelings so that they support oppression without fully realizing what they are doing. Now, these carnistic defenses tell stories, okay? They tell fictions, fictitious stories that support the ideology. The stories distort people's perceptions, and then the perceptions block our feelings, and the feelings enable the behaviors, and they look more like this. This would be an example. So carnism uses the defense mechanism that uh, is called objectification, seeing animals as objects, right? The story that objectification tells is animals are things. When we see animals as things, we think of a turkey as something rather than someone. We therefore don't feel as much natural empathy towards him or her, and it's easier to eat turkeys. Make sense? And the more we eat turkeys, the more we reinforce what? Carnism, right? Actually, if I, my Mac doesn't let me make circles, so this is supposed to be a circle. It's a feedback loop. Anyway, isn't there a word that's used to describe the fictions that are told to us by the dominant culture? Kind of, maybe? Now, there are two kinds of carnistic defenses. There's primary defenses and secondary defenses. My work has, in general, focused on primary defenses, and I'm only going to talk about them briefly today because the focus of this presentation is on secondary defenses. So, in general, primary defenses exist to validate carnism. The main overarching story that they tell is that eating animals is the right thing to do. So we have lots of examples of this. Secondary defenses, on the other hand, exist in order to invalidate veganism, to make veganism be seen as wrong. And of course, the primary story that they tell is that not eating animals is the wrong thing to do. I don't know if you guys have ever seen this book here. Don't bother. It's, it's really not worth it, but it's an example of secondary defenses. We'll talk about this a little bit more later. Primary defenses distort the truth about farmed animals and meat eaters or non-vegans. So they teach us to see animals as objects. They teach us to believe that people need to eat meat. And secondary defenses distort the truth about vegans and veganisms, right? Veganism. So for example, they tell one story they tell is that veganism is, uh, or vegans are unhealthy. So, Let's look very briefly at primary defenses. Now, the main defense of carnism is denial, which is expressed largely through invisibility. Carnism remains invisible um, in part by telling us the fiction that there is no belief system. We keep the belief system unnamed, right? So eating animals is just, it's a given rather than a choice. Carnism also stays invisible by keeping its victims out of sight. And so another fiction that denial tells is that there is no problem. What are you talking? What are you all upset about? Nothing's wrong. 
Another defense is justification. There are many fictions that support justification, but they fall under what I refer to primarily as the three ends of justification. We learn the stories, eating animals is normal, natural, and necessary. And of course, these same fictions have been used to support other violent practices, such as slavery, male dominance, heterosexual supremacy, and finally, carnism uses a set of defenses that are cognitive distortions, that distort our perceptions of animals so that we're more comfortable consuming them. So one story that carnism tells is um, that animals are objects using the defense of objectification. We learn to think that animals are not individuals. A pig is a pig and all pigs are the same. And we learn to believe that animals belong in categories. Some animals we care about, other animals we eat. Now, many vegans have an intuitive understanding of these primary carnistic defenses. I mean, a lot of our activism is actually organized around telling the truth. So, for example, you know, we have campaigns that are designed, right, to make the invisible visible. This is a campaign in the United States where you get paid a dollar to watch a four-minute video of undercover footage of factory farms. We have campaigns that challenge categories, and I think you guys have something similar here, a lot of similar ones here. We have campaigns or, or farm sanctuaries that validate individuality, where people can, can meet farmed animals as individuals. So as vegans, we actually have this intuitive understanding that non-vegans or meat eaters are looking at the world through the lens of carnism. And our activism is designed to challenge these perceptions. What we often don't recognize, however, is that as vegans, we are also looking at the world through the lens of carnism, through the sphere of secondary defenses. In other words, as vegans, we typically believe in some or all of the fictitious stories that carnism tells about us and our ideology and our movement. Now, secondary defenses, as I explained, exist to invalidate anything that challenges carnism. And they do this in several ways. They invalidate vegans as individuals. They invalidate vegan ideology and practice. And they invalidate the vegan movement as a whole. Now before I talk about examples of these, I want to point out that secondary defenses are part of a backlash against the vegan movement. Do, have you guys heard this term, backlash? Right? So a backlash is a, a reaction of the dominant culture when its power is challenged. The culture fights back only when a social movement actually gets strong enough to really be a threat. So the thing about backlash and secondary defenses is that these defenses evolve and intensify as the vegan movement evolves and intensifies. They're a sign of our success, not our failure. I can't tell you how many vegans come to me in despair over the fact that we now have happy meat. You have, do you call it happy meat here? Humane meat, bio meat. You know what I'm talking about, right? Happy to be eaten animals, right? And vegans say, oh my God, after all of our efforts, in spite all of our efforts, now we have to deal with this? And I say it's not in spite of our efforts, it's because of them people are now actually really questioning their choices to eat animals. And of course, animal agribusiness is greenwashing. They're coming back with these PR campaigns. But that would, it has only happened because the vegan movement has been as successful as it is. So we should be very proud of ourselves and perhaps less frustrated when we see some of these signs of backlash. One main uh, secondary defense is projection, okay? Projection invalidates vegans and therefore our message. If we shoot the messenger, we don't have to take seriously the implications of their message. Projection tells the story, vegans are wrong. So one kind of projection has to do with the qualities of carnistic culture. Sometimes vegans are shown, one story that this tells, that vegans have the undesirable qualities of the culture. For example, we are called biased and extremist whenever we challenge the biases and the extreme practices of the dominant culture. 
Sometimes we are portrayed as not having the desirable qualities of the dominant culture, so we're called overly emotional or sensationalist. When we question or challenge the apathy and the numbing, the lack of feeling in the dominant culture. When we don't recognize these projections, we can actually believe in these stories. And we can end up feeling like something's wrong with us, like we're too sensitive because we're, have you heard this before? You're too, you know what I'm talking about. We're too sensitive because we are upset. We're unhappy about what's happening. But when we recognize this defense, we can realize that our emotions of sadness, grief, and outrage are actually normal, healthy responses to the atrocity that's happening all around us. When it comes to this issue, the world needs more emotion, not less. Thank you. Sometimes carnistic culture projects onto us shallow vegan stereotypes. So if we advocate peace, for example, we might be seen as a tofu-loving, tree-hugging hippie. If we express our outrage over the atrocity that's happening all around us, we're militant human haters. Now, if we don't recognize these projections, we can actually act them out and become them in sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy. There's nothing wrong with being a hippie, but there is a problem with being uh, reduced to a one-dimensional image. Another projection makes us seem like we have to be the all-powerful vegan. Um, in other words, we're actually told, we're given the message that we only have a right to our ideology if we can live up to an impossible ideal. So, for example, we're expected to be paragons of health, perfect models of perfect health all the time. I'm just curious, have you ever pretended that you're not sick <laughs> around meat eaters? Okay, right? Because as soon as you sneeze, it's because you're a vegan. <laughs> Something's wrong with you. But the guy next door who just had open heart surgery after a lifetime of eating hamburgers has bad genetics. <laughs> and we're also expected to be paragons of virtue with like, you know, the moral consistency of the Buddha. So, we're hypocrites if we wear silk, but then we're extremists if we don't. And we're expected to be experts on everything. I mean, think about it. It's like agricultural economics, organic, veganic, hydroponic mushroom farming, quantum physics. So, like, we're only allowed to uh, talk about veganism if we have all the answers to the problem of carnism. I mean, just imagine somebody who's working for, like, blind children, for example, being cross-examined and attacked because they don't understand the new pharmaceutical implications of restoring sight, and they don't understand retinal surgery, and, I mean, it would never happen, right? So nobody's going to have all the answers to the problem that is carnism, and certainly we're not going to be able to figure this all out for a long time. But when we don't live up to this impossible ideal, then it becomes an excuse to invalidate everything we stand for. And this puts a tremendous amount of pressure on us. So many vegans feel like they have to be perfect. So many vegans feel like, you know, I am the ambassador for the movement, for better or worse. I'm the only person who's vegan that's meeting these people so I better turn everybody around me vegan. And if I don't, I have failed and I feel guilty. Can you relate to this a little bit? Okay, so the good news is that we cannot and we should not be perfect. It's not fair. This is a projection of the dominant culture. It's one of the reasons that we burn out and get exhausted and get frustrated because you have to be on all the time it's too much responsibility for one person to carry, and the whole success or failure of the movement does not rest on our shoulders, on individual shoulders, advocating all the time. People don't stop eating animals until they are ready to stop eating animals. And people, so many vegans talk to me, and they're so frustrated, and they say, you know, my friend saw earthlings. You know earthlings, right? Yeah, of course you do. I mean, 
all right, you know, and then he was like at McDonald's the next day, or, you know, what's wrong with him? He's a psychopath. People, people need to, people can be exposed to a lot of information and not change, because asking, animal, asking people to stop eating animals is not simply asking for a change of behavior, it's asking for a shift of consciousness. People don't change the way they think until they are ready to make those changes. It just, that's just straight psychology. So it's not up to us to make people change. That is too much of a burden. My friend, um, the author Colleen Patrick Goudreau says, just as your goal, plant seeds. That's it, your goal should be to plant seeds. People wanna ask you about veganism, tell them, you know, I always say, t use your story. Tell them through your story. Why did you become vegan? I became vegan because I learned about what happened I didn't want to be a part of that. And then I got really healthy. That's a great thing. That's it. You plant those seeds, live your truth. And I think that one of the most important things that we as vegans can do for our movement is to practice nonviolence toward ourselves. Because if we don't, we are going to be unhappy and exhausted and burn out, and we are animals too, and we deserve to live lives that we actually feel good about. And we deserve to be able to go to that party and just have a good time and not have to be on and that vegan who's teaching everybody. Sometimes we just need to take a break. Now, sometimes vegans internalize this projection that vegans are all powerful and should be perfect and they actually believe in vegan perfectionism and they can start believing that their brand, their form of veganism is the perfect ideal. And then those vegans can look at other vegans and start making them feel like they're imperfect and wrong. In the US, we use this expression, I don't know if you say that here, the vegan police, right? There's one way to be vegan. And I mean, this kind of perfectionism can lead to a fundamentalist thinking that's actually a problem. It's very divisive in social movements, all kinds of social movements, not just, um, not just the vegan movement. Now, a final projection is the pathologized vegan. Um, this projection tells the story, vegans are physically or mentally ill. Now, thanks to the efforts of vegan activists and vegan professionals, this image of the skinny, sickly vegan is becoming a thing of the past. But psychologically, it's not uncommon even today for people to assume, including psychologists, to assume, for example, that when a young woman decides to become vegan, that maybe, well, what do you think? Yeah, maybe she's got an eating disorder, right? So instead of recognizing that this is an incredibly psychologically healthy thing for a young person to do, to want to live in alignment with their values, we pathologize them and say, oh, what's wrong with you? You've got an eating disorder. So, you know, and this pathologizing of people who challenge oppressive systems is not new. I mean, in, uh, before slavery was abolished in the United States, um, slaves who attempted to escape were actually diagnosed with the mental illness that was called drapedomania. Because you have to be crazy if you don't want to be a slave. It is a powerful way of silencing those who speak out against the status quo. Now, another secondary defense is justification. We've talked about primary justification. It tells the fictions, eating animals is normal, natural, and unnecessary. Secondary justification invalidates vegan ideology and practice, so it tells the stories that not eating animals is, what do you think? Abnormal, unnatural, yeah. And unnecessary, unnecessary for health. We can see these secondary justifications getting expressed in this like happy meat moving, movement, like not eating animals is abnormal. Veganism is so radical. It's really so far outside the norm. I don't want to hurt animals, but I don't want to be a radical, so I'll just eat happy animals. Um, we can see how this idea of veganism being unnatural, being expressed through like the sustainability, the su sustainable meat movement. You, do you know Michael Pollan here, for example? Um, the omnivore's dilemma, you know, it's eating meat is okay as long as it's local, as long as it's environmentally conscious. And we can see this kind of challenge of um, necessary through the paleo, and I think you guys have paleo people here, okay. So, you know, the super meat. 
These are all kind of new forms of carnism that are emerging as the vegan movement becomes increasingly successful. And finally, we come full circle to denial, the main defense of the entire system. Now, as you might recall, denial tells this fiction there is no belief system. That's one of the stories that primary denial tells. But secondary denial takes this even further. Because if we believe that people who eat animals are operating outside of a belief system and a dominant belief system at that, then we believe that there's no dominant group. There's no majority group. And then we believe what? If there's no majority group, then there's also no minority group. So we fail to see that vegans are an ideological minority group. Now, this has serious implications. It may not seem like a big deal, but it's very important. Um, have you ever been in a situation, for example, where you were maybe teased or made fun of? For all the time. Okay, so always, not sometimes. Okay, but for no reason other than the fact that you're a vegan? Right, so when we don't recognize that vegans are an ideological minority group, we don't recognize that a lot of what we experience is prejudice. Carnistic prejudice is deep-seated and it is pervasive. And very often we experience the things we experience and feel like they're personal, they're about us. And they are personal and that they hurt us, but they come from a deep-seated prejudice that even the people doing them don't recognize that they have. And humor, prejudicial humor, has historically been a tool to silence people who speak out against dominant systems. I mean, think about it. When you're in a situation and people are teasing you for being vegan, you have two choices, essentially, right? You can laugh along with them, huh? and then you participate in your own oppression, right? Or you can tell them it's really not funny, and then you're, oh my god, you can't even take a joke. You're that serious vegan. But when we recognize that this is a form of prejudice, then we can speak out about the prejudice. We share the truth of our experience and how we're being impacted. Now, to um, demonstrate another reason it's important to recognize carnistic prejudice in the culture is because it's so pervasive, it creates a carnistic bias that results from the prejudice that's invisible to just about everybody in the culture. For example, when we study nutrition, we don't actually study nutrition. What do we study? We study carnistic nutrition, right? Vegan nutrition is biased, as though all nutrition is somehow neutral. Another deni a story that denial tells, as you may recall, is there is no system of oppression. There, there's no problem. If we believe this fiction, then we also believe that animal agriculture is not an atrocity. An atrocity can be described as a mass trauma or mass traumatization. And if we believe that there's no atrocity, there's no trauma happening, then we also believe, well, in the world, there's no victims, there's no perpetrators, and there are no witnesses. And this also has serious implications. For example, raise your hand if you or anybody you've known has ever experienced any of these things as the direct result of being vegan or being an activist. Just curious. Depression, intrusive thoughts, that means you just suddenly think about animal suffering, that film you wished you hadn't seen, okay. Um, nightmares about animal cruelty, loss of faith in humanity, maybe. <laughs> there we go, full house. Irritability, irritability, just getting frustrated really easily, okay. Feeling like your activism is never enough. Doesn't matter what I do, it's just never enough. The day doesn't end. Or maybe even feeling guilty for enjoying yourself. Like, when you're having fun, you're saying, how can I actually enjoy myself with all the suffering going on? Okay, you get my point, right? So, if we were to talk to, if you were to talk to somebody about this, to try to get help, emotional support, psychological support, you might be told, you know, you have depression, you have anxiety, who knows? But when we recognize these fictions for what they are, we recognize that as vegans, we are witnesses. Witnesses are those who are willing to see the truth, typically the truth of an atrocity. And all of these feelings and experiences, and there's actually a very long list, these are normal, almost inevitable responses 
to being willing to see the truth of an atrocity that is happening. They are all, in fact, symptoms of what is um, referred to as secondary trauma, or STS. Have you, you've heard of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder? Okay, secondary traumatic stress is exactly the same thing, except that it impacts people who witness, who see the violence. They're not the direct victims of the violence. And it's especially bad when you live in a culture that denies the reality of the violence in the first place. So secondary trauma is one of the main reasons for burnout in the movement and among activists. I put this book up here, it's on our website too, it's called Trauma Stewardship. It is a fantastic book for taking care of yourself if you're an activist. The good news about recognizing secondary traumatic stress is that once you recognize it, you can change it. You can actually heal it, you can prevent it, and you can create a sustainable life. A sustainable life, in my definition, is when you take into your life as much as you put out. Activists often are giving, 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 working, 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 and they're not stopping to take care of themselves. If we don't do that, we're going to have nothing left for the movement or for ourselves, and we are animals too. So um, if you're interested in this, um, you can go to our website, and I'll give you that resource later, um, and, and check out this book. Again, coming back to the denial that says there's no system of oppression, this also leads us to believe, well, if there's no system of oppression, then it's just eating animals. It's not an act of oppression. It's just a matter of personal ethics. You might have heard of that before. You do what you want to do, I'll do what I want to do. I mean, imagine it, like believing that owning African slaves, for example, had nothing to do with racism. So when we believe this fiction, we also believe that eating animals is not a social justice issue, it's a personal choice. And we therefore believe the fiction that the vegan movement is not a social justice movement. It's just a group of people who care more about animals than they do about humans. If we believe these fictions, they keep us disconnected with the other social movements that we're naturally aligned with and that we need to unite with, in my opinion, for all of our work to be successful. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes denial tells a story that there is no vegan movement. Um, veganism is just a trend, right? Like, like as though this like flourishing social movement that's trying to save lives and change the world and stop the planet from destroying itself and taking everyone with it is like a fashion statement. That's a form of denial. Or they might say, well, the vegan movement, it's tiny, weak, and effective. And vegans feel, therefore, powerless to make a difference. It doesn't matter what I do. It's not going to make a difference. These are fictions. They're stories. They're not the truth. I have been, I can assure you, I've been giving my carnism presentation and speaking. I've been on five continents now. And everywhere I go, I see the same thing, which is that the movement is just exploding. It, it is thriving, and it is growing exponentially. <laughs> So denial, scary denial in particular, in, can inevitably lead us to despair. Despair is the opposite of hope. It's the opposite of inspiration. Despair is the Achilles heel, the key challenge for movements, social movements in general. But the good news is that um, when we recognize these stories, as I said, we change our relationship with them. So instead of being reactive in our veganism, we can become proactive. When we're reactive in our veganism, it means that we are looking at the world through the lens of secondary defenses and reacting to some of its stories. It means that we have taken some of those stories that we hear about ourselves in and internalized them. In other words, that we've internalized the oppression of the culture. So then we end up doing carnism's job for us. We keep ourselves down so carnism doesn't have to work so hard. One form of internalized oppression, or one story that members of minority, all types of minority groups always hear, is that our needs are less valid and important than the needs of members of the dominant culture. So, I don't know, for example, have you ever gone to a family dinner and asked them to please just keep the cheese on the side? Or, and, and somehow the need to have a traditional meal is more important than your need to eat the meal? 
right? And this is, this is one of those messages. Um, internalized privilege is the opposite. It's what members of the dominant culture learn to believe about themselves when they learn to believe their needs are more valid and important. So for instance, I don't know if you've ever invited um, uh, a non-vegan to go to a vegan restaurant with you and they say, well, there's nothing I can eat there. What am I gonna do? Right, you know what I mean. So very often internalized oppression, this idea that I'm less valid and less important can lead to feelings of shame. I mean, I know a lot of vegans that apologize for being a picky eater, for inconveniencing people. Shame is the feeling of being less than. Shame is what we feel when we look at ourselves through the, the eyes of others and we believe their version of reality over our own. Shame is how we feel when we're apologetic for f caring about the animals and about the movement. Sometimes people who feel shame flip into its opposite, which is grandiosity. And that's feeling better than, superior, right? So when we feel shame, we look at ourselves through others' eyes too much. When we feel grandiosity, we refuse to look at ourselves through others' eyes at all. We feel better than, and we can end up shaming others, feeling superior, acting superior, for example. But when we practice proactive veganism, we don't feel shame, we don't feel grandiosity, we approach our activism and ourselves with an open mind, curiosity, an open heart, compassion, and we transform our shame into pride. Not egoistical, egotistical pride, but pride, feeling grounded in our truth, proud of who we are and what we do and what we stand for. And pride is essential for all social movements. I mean, just think about black pride, we have gay pride, and now we have veggie pride all over the world. And, and we have a lot to be proud of. We have a lot to be proud of. So ultimately, when we recognize these carnistic stories, these fictions for what we are, what they are, we don't underestimate their power. As a powerful man once said, make the lie big, make it simple, keep saying it, and eventually they will believe it. We don't underestimate their power, but we also don't overestimate their power. Because as a more powerful man once said, all through history, the way of truth has always won. There have been tyrants and murderers, but in the end, they always fall. Think of it, always. And we can therefore appreciate what is perhaps the greatest lie of all carnistic lies. And that is the lie, the fiction that people don't care. That people eat animals not because their hearts and minds have been manipulated by a violent system that's hijacked their awareness, but just because they don't care. And I can assure you, this is a lie. Everywhere I go around the world, talking to large, thank you. Thank you for helping me to see what's going on. I'm gonna actually share some of the written responses that I've gotten after presentations. Can you see it in the back? So we have reason to be very, very hopeful. As I have said, the movement is just growing and it is mushrooming everywhere I go. And so it's really important for us to remember that we are making a difference. We are making a significant difference. The world is changing. We are a part of something that's greater than our individual selves. We are all a part of a social movement that I believe will one day be looked back upon as one of, if not the most revolutionary and transformational social movements in human history.
So there's reason to be very hopeful and never to doubt that our efforts are making a difference. I mean, who you are and what you do are the greatest threat to carnism. So I want to conclude by just um, taking a moment to thank you because it's always through your stories, the many, many stories that I hear when I travel and when I get messages online. It's, it's through your stories that I always find my greatest inspiration, that I'm able to keep my vegan batteries charged and keep doing what I do. So I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for having the courage. Thank you.